Sorry, Megan. I had, a, okay. I had a snafu. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was like, oh no, what just happened? <laughs> Technology. I love it. Okay. Anyway. So, um, so yeah, I was always really interested in science, but when I started kind of formal study, you know, as an undergraduate, I just found that the lab was kind of too far removed from the world for me. Um, and that I really wanted to know the world more closely and I wanted to explore and I wanted to um, really understand how things worked. And it felt weird to be in a building doing that. And also the car compartmentalization didn't, it just seemed counterintuitive to me. Um, at least that's how my formal study was framed. And I know that has started to shift, right? There's a lot more interdisciplinary work in the sciences now, but uh, more than 20 years ago, that was less the case. So um, yeah, and I just felt, I also felt like there was not really an, all the room that I wanted for the joy and the love and the sorrow and the complexity um, of the world. So I turned to art um, because I felt like I could explore, right? In the world of art, there's no boundaries. Um, well, there's some, but there's fewer. And it felt like I could, I could really explore and that there was all the room that I needed for the complexities of the world. And so, um, that's what I, that's where I focus a lot of my energy. And I realized after a while that I could also use that to make science more accessible, right? That's how I got to science illustration as I was like, oh, I can do both things. Um, and what I have developed over the last you know, 15 years or so is a, is kind of that mission to really help demonstrate the complexity of systems, right? And complex concepts that can be sort of either inaccessible or too abstract or whatever um, for folks. And so um, that's really what I've started to focus out of my, my work um, and my, my energy on and, and really exploring like interconnectedness. Um, and so then I get here, right? I get to exploring relationships in, in ecosystems and, and understanding how ecosystems work. Um, and a lot of my work is really based in scientific, published scientific work, some, some unpublished, but mostly published scientific work. And, um, and, and kind of how, drawing these pictures, right, about, about how things work together and how things are connected. So, um, and I learned really quickly that if you focus on threatened or endangered species and or charismatic ones, things that people love, sea otters, for example, um, it's a really great way to draw people in, right? Because it's really exciting to learn about like, oh, we see sea otters and like, they're so, you know, cute and you know whatever there's all these things about them that are so interesting and and you know the the story about them recovering is really compelling um and they also play this really important role in the ecosystem um and i love this quote from lillian carswell she's a u.s fish and wildlife service biologist she works a lot on southern sea otters and she has this beautiful piece of writing um, about the recovery of species and what it means, you know, that it's not just about protecting sea otters, it's also about how they fit into the whole system, right? And this relationship in the, in the kelp beds is something we know really well. Um, it's been documented and studied extensively. And, you know, the otters putting pressure on things like abalone and urchins allows the kelp beds to be healthy. The forest is intact and all these other creatures, right? Some of our most iconic California sheep's head and blue rockfish and, and these gorgeous kelp crabs all get to live there as well um, because this apex predator is, is where it belongs um, in the ecosystem. So, I, what I, you know, what I discovered is that this, um, when I can draw folks in, right, with a, with a, with a charismatic species or a well-known species or a well-loved species, or even a well-hated species, <laughs> um, 
that's a way that we can start the conversation about the importance of habitat level protection and about, you know, how these relationships all kind of work and, and why, if we care about otters and plovers and condors, we also have to care about the places they live um, and that it's a much bigger picture than just the individual species. And so then I went to Elkhorn Slough and I was learning about all the creatures in the slough and, you know, it's just this really kind of magical place. Um, and I started to learn about the role the otters play in the slough, which is something that had been less studied, right? Not, not unknown, but less well-documented, um, at least in the scientific literature. And so, um, you know, there's kind of this, I think, awareness that the eelgrass beds, which had been really decimated and, and really declining all up and down the coast of California, were starting to recover in this way in Elkhorn Slough. And everyone kind of was like, hmm, what, what's going on there? So Brett Hughes from UC Santa Cruz did a, you know, did a research project there and discovered that the, the otters returning into the slough were putting pressure on the crabs, which is one of their favorite foods. And that was allowing these little slugs to like, you know, proliferate and, and be healthy. And they were eating the algae off the eelgrass. The algae is fed in most part, strong, you know, and significant part by the runoff, the ag runoff that runs into the slough from the surrounding farms. Um, and it, you know, it, it kind of creates this play, this, these conditions that algae love. And so the, um, but when the slugs are around and when their population is healthy, they clean off the, the eelgrass and the eelgrass is happy, which means they can provide, you know, nursery habitat for things like Pacific Dover sole and bat rays and all kinds of other creatures that live in the slough as well. Um, so that was a really exciting discovery for me as someone who has lived, you know, within a few miles of Elkhorn Slough for almost all of my adult life. <laughs> Uh, I was like, wow, who knew? And just to know that that was happening kind of, um, you know, in my lifetime, right? That, 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 that this shift and, and that this restoration of the species in my lifetime um, has also had this kind of um, cascade effect in this other system, right? Not just the kelp, but also in est an estuary. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when we, when we protect or we, um, you know, are, are helping out one species, we're also um, creating uh, conditions that benefit many others that we weren't even really kind of aware of. And so thinking about kind of things that we're not aware of and, and that, that idea of like an umbrella species. So snowy plovers is another one that comes to mind for me. Um, and, you know, plovers use all kinds of parts of the beach, right? They're down at the water line. They're, you know, eating primarily at the water line. They love the kelp flies. So they'll eat along the rack line where there's, you know, piles of kelp and, you know, there's like those clouds of flies. Plovers love that, but they also use the dunes. Um, and the dunes are where, you know, they'll kind of nest up against the dunes. They need to be above the high water line when they're nesting. Right. And so, and, you know, people sometimes see like the fencing and they're like, oh, some people are like, oh, cool. There's, you know, oh, there's plovers here. And other people are like, ah, they're plovers, you know, why can't I, you know, ride my bike or my dune buggy or my horse or whatever, run my dog out here because of these little birds. But what I think also, you know, often goes on kind of seen or recognized is that there's all these other creatures again, right? There's all these other creatures that use the dunes. Um, and so this is like yellow sand verbena, which is widespread, um, but coast buckwheat is limited to the coast and Tidestrom's lupin is a lupin that's only found on the coast of California between Sonoma County and Santa Cruz County or Monterey County. Um, so really limited range. Um, and, you know, hiding underneath that lupin is a form of the California legless lizard uh, in the in Monterey that is only there. It's the legless lizard is more widespread, and it it was considered a subspecies. The California, um, or I mean the the Monterey uh, legless lizard, but I think Fish and Wildlife has 
determine that it is actually just a like a form, but still only lives in Monterey, right? Normally they're not black, they're kind of a silver color, but the ones in Monterey are, are like almost black. Um, and in the dunes around Monterey Bay uh, is the Smith's blue butterfly, which is a critically endangered butterfly and um, uses coast buckwheat as its host plant for the caterpillars and is only found in Monterey. And so, you know, when we're talking about protecting the dune habitat for plovers, we're also talking about Smith's blue, we're talking about the lupin, we're talking about the, these little beetles that are, you know, food for all kinds of things and, and species that maybe are not um, you know, they're maybe not super uh, sensitive, but they also rely on this place. Um, and that, you know, there's kind of all this other hidden stuff going on um, sometimes that, that we're less, you know, kind of aware of. And this happens everywhere, right? This is happening in all kinds of habitats. So condors, um, so I work, so I should disclose maybe that um, I do volunteer at Pinnacles National Park. And one of the things I do is work on the condor project. So I volunteer with Cal California condors for part of the year. Um, and one of the things that's really fascinating to me about condors is that they are incredibly wide ranging species, right? They're a vulture. They can go wherever they want. And of course there is like, you know, staff and management and all kinds of things happening at Pinnacles National Park, at Grand Canyon, at Zion National Park, in the Los Padres um, National Forest, in the Sespe Wilderness. You know, there's all of these protected places that are specifically, well, um, some of them are specifically uh, kind of designated for condors, and but they're, you know, they're also places that um, are kind of helping um, the, with the recovery effort. But condors go all over the place and they rely on a healthy marine environment, right? They eat marine mammals. They eat pretty much anything that washes up on the beach. They'll eat it. Um, so marine mammals are a big source of their food on the coast. Um, they eat, you know, terrestrial mammals. Um, in this piece, I, I try to keep the domestic animals out of this, <laughs> although they are a super important food source. Um, so the terrestrial mammals are represented by mule deer, but certainly all over the state of California and in all other places that condors are currently, they definitely are eating domestic animals. So here that is primarily cattle um, that ranchers leave out, right? They'll leave a carcass out. They know the condors will take care of it. It doesn't cost them anything. Um, wild pigs, you know, uh, elk, deer, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, you know, they also rely on a healthy terrestrial environment. And that's why we have a statewide ban on lead, although lead is still the leading cause of death in, in California condors. And then also the, you know, the aquatic, the terrestrial aquatic environment. So the, the salmon are kind of the, the nod to the next uh, release site for, for California condors, which will be Redwood National Park. Um, hopefully sometime in the next, I don't know how many years, <laughs> um, the next few, I think is the plan. Um, but you know, things that takes time. Um, and so, you know, again, like there's this, this kind of need to protect a broad swath of our uh, environment in order to take care of not just a physically critically endangered bird, right? But all of these other things, California sea lions, you know, we have, of course, salmon, we know that salmon are, are struggling. The salmon populations are really struggling, but, you know, they're a huge part of the, of a healthy ecosystem, both in the, um, on the terrestrial side and in the, out in the open ocean. So, yeah, so there, you know, it's kind of all tied together and it's not just about parks or not just about protected places. It's about the whole, landscape um, and, and all the places where um, we can work together to, to help, you know, to help a recovery effort like this. Um, so another part of my work at, at Pinnacles National Park is um, I do raptor monitoring and my, my season is just wrapping up. We monitor the nests of all the, um, the raptors that, that nest in the park. And um, one of those is the prairie falcon, which is a species of special concern in California. And it relies really heavily and directly on California ground squirrels, which are super widespread and most people find terribly annoying. 
um, right? Because they, they dig up the ground, they make a mess They're you know, and they're everywhere and they just seem to be like an inexhaustible resource, which it's hard to know, right? If that's actually the case, but they're also a food source for all kinds of things. I mean, the red tailed hawks that nest down the road from my house, uh, rely almost entirely on the ground squirrels that eat all kinds of stuff, but they certainly rely on ground squirrels. But falcons, prairie falcons, um, this is their favorite food is, is ground squirrels. And of course, people poison them, the ground squirrels, because they're a nuisance. They, you know, they cause all kinds of problems. Um, but if you poison a ground squirrel and it doesn't die immediately, which they almost never do, um, and a falcon, especially a young falcon who's learning to hunt, is like, oh, a slow ground squirrel. Awesome. Easy meal. Well, a slow ground squirrel is usually a sick ground squirrel. And sometimes that's okay, right? You, they're removing disease, whatever, from the population. That's all right. But, um, but a sick ground squirrel, because it has been poisoned, now that poison is in the bird. Um, and that is usually fatal um, to the birds. So, um, and unlike with condors where, you know, sometimes we can do something about that with falcons, it's much harder. And, and mostly they just die. Um, and so there's, this, you know, so there's this other issue about how do we deal with pest, quote unquote, pest species like ground squirrels um, without also impacting other creatures. And this is, you know, this is, it's not just falcons, right? This is true about bobcats and uh, mountain lions and, you know, all kinds of predatory animals are affected when we put poison into the, into the system. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I think, understanding that, that there needs to be a balance somewhere and that we, that if we know that, if we know that there are these relationships and we know that, you know, falcons and owls and bobcats and all kinds of things eat ground squirrels, we can think really, you know, we can make really informed decisions about what it is that we need to do in order to make peace <laughs> with our, with our non-human neighbors. Um, and so then, you know, as I'm in, you know, rodents are, are often one of those things that are kind of everywhere and, and not everyone's favorite creature. But um, this piece is focused kind of on a really critical relationship around the meadow vole. So the vole is kind of the little brown creature that looks a little bit like a mouse. Um, they're about mouse size, their tails are shorter. Um, but they're the favorite food of both the white-tailed kite and the long-tailed weasel. And both of them, like, this is what they eat. Um, so, for example, the, the kite population will fluctuate based on the population of the voles. So sometimes we'll have nesting. You'll see kites nesting, and they'll be around. There'll be lots of them. And then there won't be. And that's almost always directly tied to the population of voles, the health of the vole population. Um, and same thing with the weasels. Weasels eat all kinds of stuff, same thing with kites, but voles are definitely their preference. And so that's, you know, their population again will kind of fluctuate. And actually one of the things that inspired this piece is that in 2020, I started seeing more long-tailed weasels, not a lot, like, but I saw more than I had ever seen before. They're not something you see very often. And I just kept seeing them and I thought, God, that is really weird. What is going on? And then I read that foxes, gray foxes, love eating weasels, and they often are the, the creature that controls the weasel population. And at least out here near Pinnacles, um, we had a big outbreak of canine distemper in 2019, at the end of 2019, and lots of foxes died, like a lot of foxes. Um, and so that made me go, oh, I wonder if that's why there's so many weasels and wait a minute, we had nesting, you know, we had nesting kites last year in the park and we didn't this year. So, hmm, you know, so it kind of ripples out, right? These things kind of ripple out um, from even just one thing, even something that has happened months ago, right? Um, and that sometimes it takes a while for those, those things to play out um, that we don't always, again, we don't always know, right? Until maybe later. Um, oh, oh, there we go. Okay. 
And then, you know, I, so I try to keep native, I try to focus all of my work on native species um, because I feel like native, spe native species are really important um, and we need to be thinking about what they need in order to be, to thrive and to survive. Um, and that's more and more difficult for native species because of the pressures of invasive species. Um, and so bullfrogs, American bullfrogs, are not native to this part of the country. They are really problematic. They eat tons and tons of aquatic creatures and have a really significant, can have a significant impact on the populations. And so, um, but, and that, you know, this is true in all kinds of places where, where uh, American bullfrogs live, but, you know, I was thinking about wetlands and about things like three spine sticklebacks and, you know, which is a, uh, a, a, a fish that is, you know, also in decline. Um, and I was thinking about herons and how herons are all widespread, right? Great blue herons are all over the place. They'll eat all kinds of things, but they certainly will eat bullfrogs. Um, and when they do that, they are helping other creatures like little harvest mice and sticklebacks that need all the help they can get. And so I love the thought of something that is, you know, again, this apex predator thing, but also just something that is like so familiar and widespread and much loved, great blue herons, also helping take care of at least some of the American bullfrog population. Um, and so, you know, like, and, and you know, and, and this is also about these aquatic environments and how how delicately kind of balanced they are um, and how connected they are to all kinds of other um, e ecosystems, right? That aquatic environments are, are a part of the much bigger picture. So when I was thinking about um, the San Lorenzo River and about the restoration of salmon in the river, I was thinking also about the whole watershed, right? And about how clean water and healthy watersheds and healthy rivers start way, way, way up high in the deep in the, in the watershed, right? Up in the mountains, um, away from the river, away from the ocean, away from, you know, all the places that we kind of associate with like, oh, you know, salmon. And so, um, and I just love that there are things like the, you know, Santa Cruz black salamander that live up in these kind of little rocky places um, up in the watershed of the San Lorenzo. Um, and then as you kind of move down the watershed, you know, American dippers, are they still nesting here? Nah, probably not, but there's certainly records of them being here. And you think about like, wow, American dippers in the, in the San Lorenzo watershed, that is cool. I associate them with the, with the mountains, right? With like the, the upper reaches of the Yuba River and the Yuba watershed um, and, you know, the Feather River watershed and, and those, those places, not down here, um, but they could be, you know, if our, if our watershed could support them, they would be, if there was enough water, that's another issue, right? Um, but it's just exciting to think about like how connected, how interconnected all of these things are and that, you know, the salmon are such a, I think such a powerful symbol of kind of the relationship between the, the ocean and the, and the, and the terrestrial landscape, right. And, and the need for kind of protection at all stages and all places. Right. And so if we care about things like salmon, we care about salamanders and, you know, and dippers and, and all kind and you know all kinds of creatures that share these places. Then we have to really think about the whole system, um, and it's not just about one species and taking care of one species that you know we can all agree or we can mostly agree that is important or is interesting or worthy, right, of of protection. But um, there's all kinds of creatures, and some of them we don't even know about yet, and so that's what I hope the, my work does is to help kind of illustrate um, those connections and how um, interrelated things are and how complex our systems are um, and how 
kind of exciting it can be to really learn about a place and to really get to know a place and all of the little uh, nooks and crannies where where interesting creatures live. So I see there's a few things in the chat. Marisa, are you, is this a good place to stop and take questions? Um, we don't really have any questions coming in, just a okay. lot of thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> and smiles. <laughs> um, awesome. But yeah, I guess I have a question about, so you mentioned the dippers, the salamanders, the salmon, and then are those like little, like, um, like maple? Oh, this, yeah, these are maple. Um, like the little, you know, the seeds grow in like these little paired winged, um, Mm -hmm. things there's probably a technical term I don't know <laughs> and they you know when it's but when it's time they kind of fly off the tree and yeah. you know they kind of like do this like helicopter dance down to the down to the ground so yeah that's what those are those are um giant uh big leaf maple yeah yeah it's a very distinctive look kind of unique um yeah but also right. sort of like odd an yeah. odd shaped thing not something you normally no yeah mary says helicopter thingies yeah <laughs> that's the very my very scientific term yeah. for that um i'm sure there's a botanist out there going like oh my god oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> we're artists over here yeah totally i can just claim i just pull the art card when i do yeah <laughs> do it cool yeah thank you sure um well, I will. Um, so I did, I do have a couple more slides to talk about like my process, if that's something that like, okay, well, just, I'll just keep on going. Um, so, oh boy. Um, so my process. <clears throat> so this always starts with a lot of research. Um, I think when I've done, like when I've tried to keep track of my time, um, these pieces take, take me about 80 hours or so, maybe a hundred, depending on the research, but they always start with a big pile of books. This pile of books is still sitting in front of me on my desk. Um, and I spend a lot of time kind of trying to understand the system, trying to understand like what is going on, what are the creatures doing, who are they related to, what, you know, what do I need to know? Um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the pieces are inspired by places I've been, um, places I volunteer, places I, you know, do all kinds of stuff, uh, run around, whatever. And so, um, <clears throat> and I, and I want to know what the story is, right? I want to help tell the story of a, of a place. Um, and so that's why I do, I do a lot of research before I get started. So about half of my time of these pieces is, is reading. Um, and then I start sketching, right? I start kind of narrowing down, like, what are the creatures that I want to include? How are they related? How are they going to be laid out? Where are they going to go? What role do they play? So like often, not always, but often like the predators are at the, in the middle because they are the least, um, the kind of least abundant. And then the plants and other things that are in, in greater abundance are kind of around the outside. And, and so that's sort of how the, some of the layouts are informed. Um, but, you know, I'm drawing, I'm trying to get a sense of how creatures move and how they might fit into a, a layout and, and all that. And I'm just kind of messing around with layouts. But I do start with the circle is like the basic form. I use a compass and a protractor. I do all of this by hand. Um, and some people think I'm totally crazy, but I tried to do it on the computer. I tried to do it digitally and it's so much harder for me to do it that way that I just would rather do it by hand. <laughs> I know how to use a protractor and I just fight with the computer. So it's not fun. So yeah, so that's, this is kind of the sketching and layout part of my process. Um, and then once I have all the pieces drawn, I do that all on tracing paper. Um, and then I transfer it onto the drawings onto my watercolor paper, which is what I use for the final illustration. Um, and so I use like a transfer paper um, to, to put the, yeah, to get the drawings onto the watercolor paper. I usually kind of refine the drawings. Sometimes I have to add things because I'm like, oh, there's a big hole there. I wasn't expecting, you know, I try to get everything figured out before I, before I transfer it, but it doesn't always happen. And so, you know, I'm still refining the drawing as I'm going. Um, but this is kind of, you know, when I'm getting closer and I've started to kind of figure out what I think is going to be, what it's going to look like and, and what's going to be included. 
And then um, once I get it all transferred, then I put in the ink and I do this with a brush and um, India ink. And it's really exciting. That's a very exciting part of the process for me. Um, but it's also really, it's a little bit scary because there's no removing ink from watercolor paper. I can lift watercolor off watercolor paper, but ink is nearly impossible. And so if I mess it up, like, well, I'm either starting over or I'm going to improvise, which usually I improvise, but sometimes, um, you know, that's just the way it goes. But yeah, it's really exciting to do it to that, to get it to this stage. Um, and I usually have it photographed at this stage so that if I wanted to, for example, put this on a tote bag or a towel, which I do, um, or I want to make a coloring book sometime in the future or something like that, um, I can have the line drawing done. And I don't have to, you know, it's easier to, to photograph it at this stage. So that's what I do. So I have it photographed at this stage when it has, when I've done all the ink um, part of it. And then I sometimes do a little bit of watercolor testing to make sure I'm going to get the colors right. So these are little test swatches for the Ohlone tiger beetle. Um, that's a very particular color of green. It does not come out of a tube. And so I had to mix the color and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what is going to make this color look right. So I did a bunch of little tiny paintings of little tiger beetles um, until I got it figured out. And so I, yeah, do some watercolor testing and, and all of that. Marisa, you look like you have a question. Well, also, I just love the Ohlone tiger beetle and I love <laughs> seeing this stage of it. I just think it's so great. But also um, someone did have a question about uh, your watercolor preferences. Do you oh. have a brand that you like? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so I primarily use Winsor Newton uh, artist grade. So they have like two grades. They have like a student grade and a artist grade. Um, and the only difference is really that there's a heavier pigment content in the artist grade. It's more expensive, of course, um, but well worth it. I mean, most of my watercolors I bought when I was a student in the science illustration program more than 10 years ago, and I have plenty left. Um, so, I mean, some colors more than others, of course. Um, and then I also, I have recently started using more Daniel Smith um, watercolors. One reason is that they have a lot of colors that are non-toxic. Um, so traditional paints, things like cadmium and, um, other heavy metals are, that are really problematic. And I really don't want to put them into the water system if I can avoid it. Um, and so I've started to shift over to Daniel Smith. They've done a really good job formulating some colors that are really similar to things like cadmium, but without the heavy metal in it. So yeah, that's, that's an inch. I wouldn't have thought that that's something you have to consider, but I'm, I'm glad yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I learned that as an oil painter. I, oil painting was my first kind of formal art training. And um, I definitely got very clear guidance. <laughs> I had a very, I had a painting teacher who had very, very strong opinions about toxicity because she had been dealing with health issues related to paint. And she was like, do not mess around. Like, this is serious. Like, you could be really sick. Do not mess around. So, I learned that lesson early on, but it's, it's still, it's hard to find good, good paint that, you know, that is the right color. So yeah, I'm really, I'm point. really pleased. Yeah. I'm so happy with Daniel Smith. I just, I'm yeah, they're awesome. So yeah. Any other questions? Um, not so far, but yeah, get them in the chat there. Um, cool. if you got a question, okay. I'll, I'll share it with Megan. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so watercolor, I do a little bit of watercolor testing and then, um, and then I paint and, um, and I think my slides are, there we go. Um, yeah. And so then I hand paint the whole thing and these are big, like these are about 30 inches square or so. I mean, they're not huge, but for watercolor, that's pretty big. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting and fun to kind of, um, yeah, to lay in the watercolor and to kind of bring the creatures to life. Um, and so each one, you know, even though there's like this symmetry and like I, you know, I'm using the same kind of drawing. So like on this one, there's four hermit thrushes, but I painted them all individually. So they are kind of individual 
birds. Um, so, and I don't, I try not to think about how many individual redwood needles are in this painting. I was really sick of painting redwood needles at the end of this. And I was like, hmm, I gotta, I have to remember that when I'm taking on a new project. I'm like needles, uh, I don't know, it's not very fun, um, but it's so exciting and so satisfying to see um, the end product. So, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of how um, that whole process works. And I'd love to, yeah, just, talk about, you know, whatever is on your mind, things that you have questions about, um, whether it's process related or, or otherwise. Cool. Thank you so much, Megan. And I love sure. the fetid adder's tongue in oh. this one. And that, yeah, the banana slugs are like, we associate banana slugs with the redwood forest, you mm -hmm. know, cause that's where you find them. Yeah. But then they're also so important for the fetid adder's tongue and how it like pollinates. Um, yeah. there's, yeah, so many, nuanced ecosystem relationships mm -hmm. that you're able to highlight um, and yeah. draw people's attention to, yeah. which I just love. Um, <laughs> and we did get a question that just came in from Margaret. Um, mm -hmm. And she asks, are most of your ecosystems local or in California? Do you have plans to go to distant locales? Oh, that's a great question. So yes, currently all of them are California. Um, I don't have any current plans to go need to, to any distant locales. Um, I feel like California could keep me occupied for probably more lifetimes than I am entitled to. Um, <laughs> and so I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know where, where my work might take me, but, um, but yeah, California is definitely my focus and certainly, um, where most of my work is right now. Um, but yeah, and it seems like all the ones that you showed us today are all within a couple hours of oh, yeah. the museum. They're all like Santa yeah. Cruz or um, San Benito yeah. County. But I know you also um, did a residency in Plumas National Forest and you have at least one piece from up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have a bunch. Yeah, I actually have a whole kind of not a full, well, not what I consider a full series quite yet, but, um, but yeah, a bunch of things from the mountains. So like bristlecone pines from the Eastern Sierra and um, yeah, there's that wet meadow from Plumas National Forest and uh, a piece about Jeffrey, the, the pure sands of Jeffrey Pine on the east side, like near Mono Lake. Um, I spend a lot of time up in that area uh, in the summertime. So yeah, so yeah, definitely other parts of California. But um, for now, my focus is primarily around, around these parts. And that brings me to a question that I had for you, which mm -hmm. is about like how you choose the stories that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. It sort of seems to me like, I mean, I kind of like feel a relationship to, to what you choose because me as someone who gets the opportunity to explore a lot of the habitats around this area um, through my work and just personal life, I, you know, I'm drawn to the same places you're drawn to. Like if I had to come up with a list, I'd probably come up with a similar list. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious too, like what you said about the Elkhorn Slough research and the mm -hmm. sea slugs, yeah. um, like that's something that you discovered, right? Yeah. Like um, you were already kind of looking at that place and then you found out that there was this this research or did you hear about the research? Um, like, does that ever happen for you where you're like reading the news or you mm -hmm. come across a scientific paper and you're like, I got to cover this. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it definitely happens both ways. Um, I, yeah. So Elkhorn that actually, I mean, so I was there in 2018, I think it was spring and it was you know, I was just walking around like in the evening, you know, because I was an artist in residence, I could be there after it was closed to the public. So I was just like wandering around like, you know, doo -doo -doo. and bat rays, there were bat rays out swimming in the water in the evening. And I just was floored. I was like, I've never seen this creature in the wild. Yeah. Like, me neither. I've the aquarium, <laughs> but I had never seen one in the wild. And I was just so, I was totally floored. And I was like, I have to figure out how to, a way to include them. And then I learned about, yeah, then I learned about the research with the, with the otters. You know, I, I wasn't expecting otters to be the thing there that I got excited about. Cause I was like, Oh, ever, everyone already knows about otters. What I don't need to tell the story about otters, mm -hmm. but you know, I was hanging out with otter researchers and they're like telling me about all this cool stuff. And I was like, Oh, dang it. <laughs> it is going to be otters. Like, okay. I mean, it was awesome, but it was just not what I expected. Um, 
So yeah. So sometimes it's like that. It's almost always a sort of an accident, you Mm -hmm. know, like, um, but I think like the plever piece was really inspired by the work that the restoration work that's being done right there at the museum across the street at, at Seabright beach. Um, and then, yeah, like the travels, you know, like I, so the, and the wet meadow piece, that piece that's based in Plumas national forest. So that is um, a place that we go to for butterfly surveys every summer. And last year, I did that piece maybe like two years ago or three years ago, 2020 is like an extra year (laughs) or 10. Um, But yeah, a few years ago, I did that piece. I did an an artist in residence up there and and I really wanted to tell stories about kind of these unique places in these, these forests that are kind of tucked away and are not super well, you know, they're not quite as like well-known or well-traveled as some of the other parts of the state. And Um, and then, so I did that piece. And then last year when we were up there in that meadow, uh, it's on private property, which like, you know, we're not really supposed to be there, but it's just one place that we can get like a Sierra Nevada blue, which relies on, um, shooting stars and they're, you know, it's often kind of late in the season. And so they're like, they're like more of a spring butterfly. And so we go to this little protected wet meadow because they're often there. Well, last year they logged it. And it's like that, that's it. Like it won't, it will, it it might be there, but it won't be the same. The exposure is totally different. And it's just like, ah, just, you know, it's just like, so gut wrenching. It was just gut wrenching. It was just like, oh God, oh my God, this place. And it's just like this tiny little, it's tiny, you know, and like probably there's a hundred of those places, but it, it just was like, oh man. Yeah. It really draws your attention to the importance to, to like appreciate and celebrate, um, these stories yeah. and these places. Um, yeah. That, cause yeah, I do. I feel like a lot of us, we have these places that we appreciate, um, but maybe we could appreciate them more and share them. Yeah. You just them. never know. Yeah. Right. We just never know. I mean, like the beetle, the Ohlone tiger beetle, I remember watching last year, the fires, Mm-hmm. And as the fire is creeping closer and closer to, you know, Marshall Fields, I was like, oh my God, the entire population of the Ohlone tiger beetle could be wiped out this year. I was like, I- yeah, well, but then also, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but also we might learn that it's really beneficial because it creates right. this bare ground that the right. Ohlone tiger beetle also requires. Right. right. We don't um, know. But we have to, yeah, we have to pay attention and we have to um, make these observations and, and really yeah. see so that we can know what the appropriate um, actions are to take for these yeah. places that we want to thrive. Right. Yeah. Um, you, so yeah, you mentioned your butterfly count volunteerism yeah. and the pinnacles volunteerism. And we've got some yeah. questions coming in the chat that I'll get oh, to sure. too. But I also was just wondering if you could briefly share like, what does that mean to you, these volunteer um, projects and like, what are the barriers to getting involved and what are like some advice that you might have for people who also want to have this more like intimate, intimate connection, um, to actually like really helping, um, these ecosystems that we care about. Sure. Um, yeah, I feel, I mean, I, volunteering is really important to me as just a way for me to stay, connected to these places and to kind of give what I can, right? I've, I've not ever had been in a position to provide financial support to parks or to, you know, most organizations that I care about, but I can give my time. I can, I can always do that. And so um, that's been an, a really important thing for me to, to do. Um, And, you know, the barriers are, you know, so part of that is finding the time and making sure that you, you know, know what the commitment is and and what might be required of you or asked of you. Um, Pinnacles, you know, for me, it's it's a little bit less of a barrier, at least now, because I'm closer. Um, But certainly, you know, the distance is can be difficult. Right. And, And how do you get there? Right. If you don't have a car there's really no way to get to pinnacles without a car. At least you don't have to have your own, but you got to have a car somehow. Um, And so, you know, so, or, or at least be, or be committed to riding your bike a really long ways. Um, So, you know, so there's kind of, you know, that sort of, sort of issue. Um, But I think my experience is that most organizations are happy to have volunteers, right? They need them. They rely on them. 
Um, they can't do their work without them. And so it's really a matter of like getting in touch with the right person. And sometimes that takes a while. You have to be persistent. I think, you know, sometimes you're like, do I contact the biologist? Do I contact the who, who do I talk to? Yeah. Some of them are like organizations that they've got a volunteer coordinator and they got yeah. it figured out. And then others are like, yeah, yeah there's they like might be, person. they might welcome help, but they don't, they don't know that they right. need it or how to go about. Yeah. And so sometimes it's just about persistence and, and being willing to say like, I will help however you need me to. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and well, yeah, you know, yeah, just sometimes that takes a while. Yeah. To get, just, yeah. I asked this because I'm like so envious of some of the things that you spend your time doing. It sounds so great to like, you do, yeah. you catch bats and butterflies <laughs> and do. you, you know, hang out with condors. It sounds like such an adventurous life. It um, is. It is definitely an adventure, but it sounds like it's, you know, like you can do it too. Um, Yeah. You just have to like put yourself out there and it doesn't take, you know, necessarily training ahead of time. Yeah. I, everything I learned about condors, everything I learned about bats, everything I learned about falcons and raptors and butterflies has been on the, uh, on the fly. Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) um I I was gonna say yeah like all of the things that you volunteer with they are all flyers yeah I'm a yep I do like those creatures (laughs) um but yeah I learned it all you know every every organization I've volunteered with has provided the training I need um bats were a little bit more it's a little there's a little bit more demand there because you have to be vaccinated in order to handle them and you know there's all kinds of stuff and now COVID is a whole other thing but um so that's that is a little bit specialized, but everything else I learned from the organization that I worked for or, you know, volunteered for. And so that has, I didn't have any special training before that. Like I'm not a biologist, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love hearing that. Cause I'm, yeah, I don't have a background in, in science either. I learned pretty much everything that I know from working at the museum and, you know, anyone can, um, can become inspired and can take it farther. You don't have yep. to have that yep. formal training. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, we've got a lot of questions, so I want to make okay. sure that we get to them. So sure. some are art focused and some are um, sure. ecology focused. So an okay, art cool. one is: um, Do you have uh, like a simple place to start for someone who's wanting to get into like basic botanic drawing? Do you have any recommendations? That's a great question. So I took a class through Santa Cruz Adult Ed um, on botanical illustration. Mm -hmm. And the awesome thing about like the Santa Cruz area is that you can take, you can take classes through CSU Monterey Bay, which is where the science illustration program lives now. Um, and they do summer classes that are short, like two weeks. Um, and you know, especially now in the new COVID world, I feel like most places will have online classes if you can't get to them. So like you could take a class I don't know. Does Q Garden in London have a class? Probably. <laughs> Are they doing it online? Probably. You know. <laughs> um, so I think if you're interested in any topic, right? If you're interested in botanicals or you're interested in whatever, like, do a little digging and see where where might be offering classes. And almost everywhere will have an intro class. Filoli, um, the Filoli Center up in the peninsula, they have a whole botanical series, but they have intro classes. You don't have to be like super fancy. Um, but I think that's a great place to start is to take a class. Um, and if you can't take a class, then I would say like, go to the library and find a book. I mean, I like, that's how I learned to draw. I mean, I learned, I, you know, had people around me who could teach me, but I seriously learned from like a Crayola flip book, you know, and that I loved as a kid, I just loved it. And I think even those things, even though they seem really basic, that's a really great way to learn. Because they're really, you know, it's like step by step, right? And think about the shape and, and think about, you know, like what the line looks like and that kind of thing. And those are, that's a great place to start. It's a really good place to start. Yeah. And I'll just add like nature journaling resources too, that are like, if you, if you Google science illustration, then it might show you like the more technical stuff, but nature journal is a good Mm -hmm. kind of like key phrase um, yeah. for beginners because it really is more focused on making observations than on technical yeah. skill. And I, I would say that's a good place to start too, coming from someone who I'm not, a, sure. I'm not a very technically yeah. great uh, artist at all. Um, but I 
find it to be a rewarding experience when I'm trying to um, just kind of record observations and not have it be necessarily beautiful. And that's, a yeah, it doesn't thing. have to be beautiful. I mean, I, my sketchbooks are not beautiful. Some, <laughs> some of them are. Some oh, I'm sure they're, them are. I'm sure some are. of them, some pieces <laughs> are, but the whole thing, no, it's a mess. It's okay. <laughs> that's part of the process, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and there is a, there's a nature journaling um, conference coming up at the end of the month. Yeah, maybe I'll include that in our resource uh, email too. Yeah. Megan shared a bunch of resources that I'm going to be emailing out, but then I'll, I've got a couple more too. So I'll add that in. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question about mountain lions. Do you have any pieces that, that feature mountain lions as an apex predator? Not yet. So that's one of those creatures like red-tailed hawks and California quail and bald eagles. I'm like, oh, I got to be really careful when I use that. Cause I really try not to duplicate. I mean, the otters is like sort of a special oh, yeah. case. Um, and, but I'm like, oh, if I'm not going to duplicate, I just haven't figured out what the story is yet. Um, mm -hmm. Do I tell the story of the mountain lions in the Santa Monica mountains or the Santa Cruz mountains, or mm -hmm. I don't know yet. So no, wait until something really clicks and resonates. Yeah. Something will, something will show up. I mean, I do feel like the urban mountain lion story is compelling. I think, especially because people are so freaked out. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's really, <laughs> isn't there, wasn't there, a, um, research recently about, uh, lichen and like, um, oh. like absorbing pollution from fog and like it having oh. some sort of effect on mountain lions. Wasn't there something? Oh, like I don't know. I'm sure that it is though. And it's oh, I'll have to, around I'm here making things up here, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah. want you to do lichen is all I'm. Oh, okay. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Oh man. The list is so long. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so long yeah like I said well yeah and you didn't share your sand hills piece which I mean I sorry ugh, Can't share there's so many yeah which also brings me to another question someone was wondering how like how many um, pieces are there totally within this series the habitat series right good question so currently there are 19 yeah um I have plans for as many as I can do in my lifetime which you know I don't know how many more that will be. Like, I have no idea. So I'm just going to keep doing them until yeah. I'm done. Cool. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. And then um, someone was wondering about the plants, which I was wondering about this too, because it seems yeah. to me like you're very like um, inspired by uh, the, the fauna as yeah. being kind of like an anchor within yeah. these ecosystem pieces, but then you for also sure. include plants. Um, yeah. And there are also just like so many options for plants in a lot of these ecosystems. So like, how do you choose which plants to um, include? And do you go from the dominant plant, for instance, the redwood or particular plants that play key ecosystem roles um, or particular plants that you have an affinity for mm -hmm. or? Oh man, All, yes. <laughs> All of those things. So like this piece, right, the redwoods, you know, I felt like, okay, how do you, how do you choose with redwood? Right. Because there are so many, there's so many plants. Um, but I wanted to feature, so, you know, this one is also a little bit personal, right? So I work at UC Santa Cruz and right outside my office are these gorgeous azaleas. They're gorgeous. And I was like, ah you know, how can I not include azaleas? Like they're so beautiful and it's such a cool plant. Um, but I also felt like, wow, fetid adder's tongue is such a cool part of the redwood story. Um, and like you said, with the, with the banana slugs and, and they, and they come out early. So most people don't really see them because they just like are here and they're gone. And people are like, what they bloom in February. What, you know? Um, although this year I feel like people really like everyone's like, get me outside. Oh my God, fetid adder songs are everywhere. And I'm like, well, I think they're always everywhere, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe that's true too. This was the year yeah. of the fetid adder's tongue for me it too. It totally was. So yeah, so partially it's about affinity, partially it's about the place. Um, but I did do like last, so last year during the pandemic, I just happened to be ready to do a whole bunch of, of work about the Santa Cruz mountains. And so I also wanted to tell the story about there's other plants, right? There's tan oaks and giant chinkapin and, um, you know, the, the, and bay laurels and California hazelnuts. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and I wanted to really kind of, yeah, feature like all of these different 
communities that live just in this, in our tiny little mountain range, you know? Um, so yeah, some of it is about the place and about, yeah, like a key, a key species. I mean, I could, I could do a hundred redwood ones, right? This doesn't talk about mirrors nesting up there in the canopy. It's not, there's nothing about, you know, Stellar's jays or owls, or, I mean, it just yeah. could go on and on, but I, you know, I got to narrow it down too, because I have to make decisions. Um, and it's hard. It's super hard, but I, yeah. I do choose things that I, yeah, I have an affinity for, but I also think are maybe important parts of the story. So like the piece that has the tan oak also has bay laurel, which are kind of, they're like that transitional, you know, as you get kind of away from the, the damp part of the redwood forest into the drier part, um, that's where you get tan oaks. And, and then of course, like Doug fir, I haven't even touched Doug fir yet either, because same thing, how do I narrow it down for Doug fir? Yeah. Um, well, and it sounds so, yeah. like you kind of like some pieces are anchored in, uh, a key like ecosystem story, like yeah. based on the interaction, whereas mm -hmm. others are maybe more like this is the habitat. Yeah. So maybe yeah. so there will probably be more redwood forests. Oh man. I, I, I don't know have to I draw more not. needles. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm like, I gotta find a better way than drawing like 8,000 needles. Yeah. <laughs> um, Margaret also asks um, if invasive species ever featured into your habitat stories. And I know that you said that like you um, are really, really passionate about focusing on yeah. native species. But then also, I mean, a lot of the, the ecosystem stories that are within them are based on like what's at risk maybe because of invasive species. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, like have you, have you considered including invasive species or um, including domestic animals? I have. So the the falcon piece does have a rhodium, which is an invasive weed, okay. um, invasive plant. And the- I thought that was, yeah, I was gonna yeah, ask actually. It's totally a rhodium, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, the squirrels love it. The squirrels totally love it. Um, and, and it's a big part of the ecosystem, whether I like it or not, mm -hmm. it's a huge part of the ecosystem. And so I have a piece, I didn't show it, but I have a piece about sage grouse, right? Which are super critically endangered species. And they live in the sagebrush um, and the, like the, we don't have very many in California, like way, way out there on the Eastern edge where California turns into the Great Basin um, on the East side of the Sierra. And I was talking to one of the researchers about it. And I was like, you know, I'm trying to figure out the plants. And they were like, you need to include cheatgrass. And I was like, no, he's like, we wouldn't even be talking about sage grouse if it wasn't for cheatgrass. And I was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I was like, I refuse, but it's true, right? Like we would not be, sage grouse would not be in trouble if it wasn't for cheap grass, which is a super invasive weed. And, you know, it, it catches fire, it rips through the sagebrush and it just destroys the habitat. Um, and not only, you know, because of fire, but also just kind of chokes the whole landscape with this, this like super wild grass. So I, I definitely consider it. I sometimes just put my foot down and say no, but like I also included the bullfrog, right? right. Um, and I do feel like there will probably be a time when I have to include, you know, for condors or for other creatures, like I, you know, I have to admit that um, grazing, for example, which currently we use cattle or sheep um, is, a, is critical for some habitat right? It mm -hmm. keeps down the grass, the mm -hmm. invasive grass, so that things like um, the bay checker spot can survive in these little pockets around the bay. And mm -hmm. if it wasn't for grazing, if it wasn't for cattle, they probably would be gone. So maybe. Yeah. And there, and the cattle are in some ways replacing native right. megafauna that are no longer. That's right. It's like, yeah, there's, you know, you can always yeah. pull things back far enough to yeah. um to make yeah. a new justification but yeah it's, it sounds to me like we all have a lot of um requests for you <laughs> oh yeah forward. please <laughs> I'll just throw them on the list yeah <laughs> which I, mean, I guess that brings me to a question that I have for you which is like yeah. do you have a, a next um piece in mind like one that you're still dreaming about or one that you're currently working on um, I'm still researching. Um, so Pinoch Valley is not too far from where I live right now in the COVID times. Um, and um, it's uh, home to things like San Joaquin kit fox 
and um, blunt-nosed leopard lizard and all these really cool species that live like in very kind of, they're kind of pushed into these remnants of the San Joaquin desert, um, which really is like Pinoche Valley and Carrizo Plain. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so I'm, tr I'm trying to figure, and then like a huge solar farm was just built out in Pinoche Valley mm -hmm. and just like totally took over a huge swath of the valley. But as part of the quote unquote mitigation, a preserve was also established and there are kit foxes like nest, you know, nesting, um, you know, they have dens and they're breeding there and stuff. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, you know, it's a mixed bag, but, um, but yeah, so Pinoche Valley and Carrizo Plain are definitely on my radar. Um, I'm also doing some research for more Bay Area things. So like Bay Checker Spot and Salt, um, salt Marsh Harvest Mouse. And I, I desperately want to tell the story of the peregrine falcons that nest on the buildings of the Bay Area because that just like blows my mind. You know, every year it blows my mind that there are birds that nest on pg e and on San Jose City Hall. I just, I just can't believe it. <laughs> You know, because I was not, I mean, I grew up there and I, there were no, I don't, there were no peregrines. Yeah. You know, none. They've, they've found a way. There, there's some, some folks, some <laughs> Glenn Stewart is a, you know, he and the research folks at Santa Cruz and, and all those folks who worked on the, on the peregrine recovery have, I mean, I just feel forever indebted to them mm. for reintroducing that species to California because they wouldn't be here without them. It's amazing. So, yeah. and we get yeah. to see them here in Santa Cruz. I know, I know. Out. I mean, I see peregrines all the time now <laughs> yeah. and it's just like, wow, so cool. Yeah, it is. So yeah. Um, well, if anyone else has any other questions, I would recommend getting them in the um, chat now. Um, and Lisa asked, do you sell prints of your illustrations? And yes, you do, which um, <laughs> brings me to something I'm gonna, I'm gonna take over sharing um, oh, good. Yeah. screen now. Okay. And um, so again, Megan's work is featured in our science illustration exhibit, The Art of Nature, which closes on June 27th. So um, the museum is open. We're open Tuesday through Sunday, 11 to 3. So come visit um, her work and, and other artists work um, there. I think there are about 30 artists in this uh, year's exhibition. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a virtual show, which I will send a link for. And um, we have... Uh, pieces of Megan's um, in our store. And then also we are having a maker's market on Saturday and Megan will be there along with nine other artists from the show, including, um, so everyone's gonna be doing demonstrations of their work. So you can watch the artists in action. And I'm just gonna say the exciting little bit of news that we recently got, which is that Yvonne Byers is gonna be doing tattooing in the park, which I'm just so excited about. Cause, yeah, cause her piece this year is actually a tattoo. Um, so lots of different mediums on display and you can um, purchase work from the artists, including from Megan at the Maker's Market. Um, and then we'll have uh, consignment items from other artists who won't be present as well. Um, so please join us for, um, for the Maker's Market. Come see the exhibit. I'll be sharing a, an email probably tomorrow once I get the recording up. Um, with a link to a survey as well as resources from Megan and links to these things. And the recording will be slightly truncated because I pushed a wrong button. So we've missed just the part of me spieling. So it's not that big of a deal, um, but great. So um, I think that we can call it a night. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Megan, thank you so much for sharing your work and all of these really interesting stories. We live in a really special spot. Today. We live in such a special place. I don't know that there's anywhere that I wouldn't find such excitement, but yeah, it's this yeah, place that's is true. particularly that's true. You, I know, and I'll, I'll just share like one last thing. Megan for Shelter in Place, she did a daily diary, which I guess is still going on, right? Megan? No, no, you I stopped. stopped. It. Okay. <laughs> Memorial Day, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, but like every single day, uh, Shelter in Place, like, musing on what you noticed and you were able to notice things every day and really interesting stories and really interesting observations every day and yeah you know all of us can do it too 440 days it was pretty <laughs> amazing just and even small things right yeah. this is the color of the grass today 
Those, yes. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be a California condor. No. It can also be I've never a, had a condor in my house. <laughs> helicopter thingy. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday, Megan, and I hope to see a bunch of you guys there too. So thank you. Thank you, Marisa. And thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate it.